okay, this is module six, which is about digital marketing. And we have a module 10, which deals to B2C. And I'm going to update the B2C a little bit, but I'm really actually going to talk, spend more time talking about some of these new things, social media marketing and, and uh, uh, stuff like that uh, in this particular module. Uh, I anticipate that, you know, even though I'm, I'm taping this in 2014, that probably this will be the only time it's ever seen. Uh, a year from now, I'll have to do a, a totally new lecture. Maybe I can get away with using it uh, for a year. But uh, two semesters, maybe at the most, uh, that might be, you know, even that might might be a little bit optimistic. I uh, might be able to use it through the spring of 2015, maybe. Uh, but that's even that's a little bit optimistic. Uh, first thing I want to say about digital markets, a lot of opportunities. This is a huge new field, and there's a lot of opportunities. Typically, when something new occurs, some new phenomenon occurs, uh, the dot-com era. You find a lot of, there's a, a, a lot of dynamism in the market. Now, when you think about dynamism, a lot of uncertainty, uh, it mean, you know, when you think about dynamism, it means that there will be some businesses that come out of nowhere and, and be, become, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. I mean, it, it, at one point, uh, you have companies like Google and uh, Microsoft and, and companies like that that have the, the, uh, the same market capitalization. In other words, their total wealth uh, is as much as the great skions of, of, of industry that have been around for a century, a century and a half, your, your Exxons and your, your Dutch Shells and your BP Oil and, and companies like that. They're of the market capitalization of some of the new dot-coms was equivalent to that. And I remember, you know, companies like Priceline would have market capitalizations near, you know, the, the, the put them in the top 50 of or top 100 of, of all the companies in the world. And so you have you have a lot. When this happens, you have these great successes and you also have great failures. In module 10, I'll talk about the failure in the grocery business, the online grocery business. You have a uh, huge company, Streamline, Peapod, other huge companies. They opened up uh, operations operations all across the country. Uh, 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 most of them went broke. Peapod did not go broke because it was bought out by the, one of the biggest uh, grocery retailers in the world, and I, I'm going to mispronounce it. I'm going to say Ahold, A-H-O-L-D. It's a Dutch uh, grocery company. They operate giants and jumbos. If you lived in an area of the country, there are giant stores and jumbo stores. That's uh, Royal Ahold, uh, the, the a Dutch company, bought Peapot out. So, I, I you know, as far, last time I checked, Peapot was still around. Most of the others have gone out of business. Uh, in the in the, the all the big operators, uh, Streamline and and Web Band and Web Grocer and all those companies. Now you, there may still be a Web Grocer because the the name itself was bought at auction. But the, most of those companies just went stone belly up. So you have a lot of people that make decisions that don't make a lot of sense. There's also a lot of companies that were paying at the time of the dot com bust. They they would pay like twenty five dollars per thousand impressions of your kind of random, untargeted uh, banner ad. And they didn't know who was watching it. You know, there was no targeting. There was no information about who received it. They would just show the, the ad, you know, a thousand times with Yahoo or one of the other big portals or companies would show the ad and they would get $25, $25 per thousand impressions. And it's crazy. And companies were paying that. Uh, the companies were paying that. That people didn't, you know, all of a sudden somebody says, well, you know, I never pay any attention to a banner ad on the Internet. I never click on one of these random banner ads, and 99% of which have absolutely nothing to do with me, and I don't even notice them. Uh, and then somebody else says, well, if, if nobody pays any attention, nobody's clicking on, why are we paying $25 per thousand impressions for ads like that? So your, your mainstream marketing entities were saying, well, this is not going to work. Uh, the same is true in social media. And with this new age in, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, talk about consumer empowerment. It's a new time. It's a new era. Uh, people are doing things differently. Uh, as I'm taping this, the students in, in the 2014 class are working on a project where they're going to analyze Super Bowl ads. Uh, the Super Bowl ads, you know, the price has gone up again this year, and the people are paying uh, the average is more than $4 million for a 30-second spot. Did they get the bang for the buck? I think a lot of the people that I talked to, because they know, you know, I was on the radio show, I was on the uh, 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 Larry Brogan and, and uh, Fred McCara's 
radio show here in the the Tri Cities, Business Matters, and it was talking about the, the Super Bowl ads. And and most of the people, a lot of people, come up to me and say, you know, I like this ad, I didn't like that ad, I thought that ad was horrible, and I don't think it's right in family programming to have, you know, uh, one of these racy uh, Dan and Yo or the the weakest uh, yogurt ad or some of the other things that uh, that were on. And I don't, you know, or the uh, the Beckham uh, H&M ad, you know, and family program and my little uh, six-year-old girls there and and I shouldn't need to see that. And I, so I, everybody comes and comments to me. The general feeling I had from the other people's comments, and this is not my own personal opinion, uh, was that the ads were have, have gotten worse. The ads are weaker and they're not doing as, uh, you know, the ads are not as good. The uh, Even some of the ads that tried to be a reprise of what they did last year or the year before, the some of the the Chrysler ads, you know, the 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 they, they reprised the kind of last year in 2000, the 2013 Super Bowl for the 2012 season. They had the, a really big hit with Billy Graham, the farmer ad. And uh, the year before, they had uh, Clint Eastwood and, you know, this is Detroit and Detroit's going to come back and Detroit's strong. And, and, and so some of these ads, uh, I, you know, people thought weren't as good. Uh, I, at the same time, uh, the Super Bowl is one of the very few places now where you can reach large numbers of people on television. Uh, the fact is that people are watching way less television. I think if you think about the phenomenon of how we live our lives, and that may be include, and that's probably true for many of y'all. How much television do you watch now versus how much television do you watch five years ago? And then if you look at it for the group they call the demo. The, the key demographic group for most advertisers is kind of your 18 to 35 or uh, 16 to 45 or whatever, uh, however that's defined, depending on your, your target market consumer. Uh, the demo group is really watching a lot less television, and particularly young males are watching a lot less television. Uh, when we do watch television, we're not perceiving the commercials nearly as much. You know, we, we're DVRing and watching or we're watching in some other format like we're waiting for the shows to come out on Hulu or Netflix and uh, or, or some other similar type of thing. People are playing, young kids are playing a lot of computer games. Uh, they're not watching television, they're playing computer games. So the, the television, the whole traditional advertising has gone down. People are reading a lot less newspapers. Uh, people, for those of y'all that are not student center watching this, my students have a, a project on the future of uh, news content delivery, uh, and, and uh, it, it, they generally I time it for about the same time as the Pew Trust comes up with their their annual report on the the state of the of the news industry, and uh, it'd be about the same time of year, being in, in in April when they do that project, and and I, I'm not optimistic about the future of your traditional newspaper yet at the same time I mean you know somebody's the the very the, the newspapers are suffering their ad revenues going down but they're still here and there's a lot of people that I guess get up in the morning some of y'all have parents or something like that get up in the morning and get the physical newspaper I constantly have people coming and telling me you know I read about this in the newspaper like our football coach uh, left for a, a, a another job you know and we so we lost our football I was the last but even though I'm a big Big football, ETSU football fan. I'm a huge ETSU football fan. I go to all the games. Uh, I, you know, if I'm in town, I definitely do not miss an ETSU football game. But I was the last person to know because I don't read the newspaper. And of course, they did, they didn't. They waited three days to put it up on the website here at ETSU too. So that's another thing. But. Uh, so I don't read the newspaper. A lot of the people I know don't read the newspaper, but there are a lot of people who still do read the newspaper and still read the physical newspaper. Uh, Warren Buffett said, you know, the, for the, in, in terms of the, the future of uh, digital content, he said, I don't really, and he said this like six or seven years ago. He said, I'm really pessimistic about the future of newspapers and magazines and things like that. Uh, it's, people can get the same information faster, cheaper, and better on the internet than they can from a, a weekly magazine. I, if, you know, how can that their business model sustain itself in a, in a situation like that? They, so the, the point here is that everything, when things are in a state of flux, it's a big opportunity. When things are kind of stayed and everything's running along and it's normal course, businesses tend to keep doing what they've always been doing. 
and they're happy doing what they've always been doing and they don't see a need well you know why should we get involved with facebook why should we have a facebook site why should we uh you know why should we advertise do uh, uh, buy search advertising uh metrics you know buy uh, search engine optimization uh, pay money for search engine optimization and why should we uh, hire somebody to manage our our social media uh, the our, you know social media related to our business. Why should we do that? Well, and, and, but when things are in a state of flux, everybody's looking for something new. And the honest truth is, most companies, particularly here in the United States, are run by people that are past the digital age. You know, they did not grow up in the digital age, and they you know they're using their smartphone is about as far as they've got progressed. So many of the decisions are being made by people that don't have any idea. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who have MBAs. How many people have a, a, a master's degree in digital marketing? How common is that? Uh, very rare. How much digital marketing content have we had in our MBA program to this point? Uh, so there's not a lot of people out there trained to do it. Uh, there are new companies and startups. In fact, a couple of the most successful uh marketing companies in this area, one of the main things they're doing is peer-to-peer uh, -peer management. You know, Adam Bo uh, Bowie uh, and his companies and uh, Tony Treadway and uh, his companies, uh, that's what, that's, you know, the new thing that they're doing. They're, they're you know, going out and they're, they're soliciting business and they tell them, you know, we'll manage the social media, we'll set up your Facebook site, we'll, we'll get content on there. You know, we got people that'll write stuff and we'll get some good content on there and we'll try to get your, your likes up on Facebook and, and uh, we'll, you know, monitor uh, things that happen on other peer-to-peer -peer sites and, and, uh, and, you know, we'll do that for you and they've been very, really successful. I mean, those are two, you know, uh, the most successful entrepreneurs in this area are working in this very field. Uh, one of them will have a pro has, has, has offered to uh, come in and help me set up a real world project for my students, uh, for the students in this spring of, of 2014. And I'm really looking forward to that. That'll be one of your, uh, your April assignments. And I'm looking forward to it, really looking forward to that. So there's a lot of opportunities. Companies need people that know something about this field. There's also a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs, the uh, people that go in and, and will help you optimize, optimize your marketing, uh, integrate your, your digital content, your digital marketing, uh, your, you know, the people that could go in and what they're really doing is publicity. For example, if, if Tony Treadway manages a company's website and he has somebody there that's creating content for their Facebook page or content for their website or content that, that, is, uh, you know, that, that is connected to different blogs and other things or, or different industry publications, uh, online publications or industry newsletters and, and things like that, then if they create that content, that's really, if it's not paid, it's, it's technically, we would call that public relations. Now, we don't call it public, you know, I don't think Tony would think of it as public relations, but we, in the pure sense of how we in marketing define, if it's paid, it's advertising, if it's non-paid, it's public relations, how we would define that, uh, managing public relations efforts is going to be uh, really big in the future. And I think a lot of PR firms don't know what to do right now. They, they're still thinking fax out press releases. You know, that's, they're still there thinking, uh, press releases. So the, 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 the companies are looking for new young people who've been trained in this field and have some uh, acumen in this field. Uh, you students should definitely save your portfolio of work that you've done. You should put it in a portfolio or a book, uh, the different projects that you do in this class and other classes, particularly the projects that we do related to social media and uh, related to marketing, you know, using social media for marketing and things like that. Save that, put it in a, 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 a portfolio of work, and then uh, when you, as you, you, which you should be now, uh, already most of y'all, since you, you should be taking the, this marketing strategy class toward the end of the MBA, typically the semester before your strategic project, uh, you should be uh, contacting employers now and uh, have examples of your work ready uh, to show them when you, as you uh, try to get a job with your, with your MBA degree. So there are many opportunities. Now, first of all, I want to talk about the concept of consumer empowerment. This is an era in which all of a sudden the, 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 the asymmetrical access to information 
and to the control of information has been turned on its head. And traditionally in past eras, if a company mistreated somebody, unless some journalist found out about it and wrote one of these expose articles in the newspaper, in a newspaper or magazine, uh, you know, somebody you could go around and tell all the people you know about this horrible company that, that took advantage, tried to take advantage of you or took advantage of you, this uh, horrible product you bought that, you know, fell apart, $2,000 refrigerator that fell apart after uh, two years uh, and, you know, wouldn't work anymore. Uh, the other things like that, uh, the, the, the access that the the companies had, corporations had, to being able to uh, control what was being said about a particular brand. Because most of what people learned about a brand, they learned through advertising. Or maybe uh, some stuff going in the store and talking to a salesman. And that was, they learned everything. So the flow of information was very, very one-sided. And the ability of consumers to communicate that a product was inferior or something was really bad was very limited. Uh, the example, the first example I want to give is a, a kryptonite lock, and it happened about five years ago. Uh, somebody, kryptonite, uh, they make, is a company that makes locks, and particularly they make them for bicycles. Uh, in Europe, many people, even executives, ride their bicycle. If you live in a big, huge city, a bicycle is a very efficient form of transportation. Uh, European cities, you know, in, in Denmark, where the, the price of gas is $10 a gallon, and uh, it, it, you know, it makes sense. They have bike lanes and their protections for bike riders and their special, you know, bike riders can ride when other people can't. And you know, you get a hero in the office because you have such a low carbon footprint and everybody looks up to you and you get to stay healthy at the same time that you're commuting. So it's very common for people to ride uh, bicycles, to commute with bicycles and stuff like that. And uh, they, you know, they, they need bike locks to keep them from being stolen. And Kryptonite was one of the top companies in that line. Somebody took a, a show, made a video, put it on YouTube, and you can actually see, like, picking a kryptonite lock. You can go to YouTube now and watch the video and come back if you want, taking the, the, the cap of a, of a big pen and uh, unlocking a uh, kryptonite lock. And so you have a company that has all these products, and in particular, it worked particularly well for their best and most supposedly most secure locks that people would put on their $500 bicycles or $1,000 bicycles and uh, to keep them from being stolen. And all of a sudden, you have a company that, that is the leader in its field. And now, and the, the, of course, the video went viral and the whole world saw it. And now you have that, you know, at that point, you have a company that has a bunch of products that are essentially worthless. Of a company that was, you know, worth billions and billions of dollars one day and had all these great products, and the next day the company, none of the company's products are any good. And of course they, you know, figured out a way to fix the problem and to redo the locks or to, you know, put a device on there so that it, uh, the the big pen thing wouldn't work. But it's a, it just shows you how something can go on YouTube showing a product failing or a weakness of a particular product, and all of a sudden it goes viral and everybody in the world knows that that product is no good anymore. Uh, people, you know, bad products. Uh, there's most of your retail sites, for example, have reviews. Amazon uh, allows unbleached reviews. Uh, they, you know, they don't go through and scramble out and take out the bad ones. You can go and look at, at reviews on Amazon, and some of them are very bad for some of the products. If somebody sells a product uh, that that is poor, the uh, uh, sells a product that is poor or has poor service, uh, they get dinged pretty quickly. And uh, I can remember I bought a product at uh, Bass Pro Shops, and the uh, uh, it, it didn't work. And uh, I took it back to exchange it, and then uh, before I took it back to exchange it, I happened to look on the web. Should have done this before I bought it. And there's a literally a review there at Bass. This is this is the worst product I ever bought at Bass Pro Shop. Literally right there, like one of the first few reviews, and then every review was negative about that product. Uh, uh, <laughs> Right there on the by, uh, and you know on the website of the company that sells a product, so 
whenever things happen, people are much more likely to find out about it. Consumers interact, hang out together, uh, are interconnected in ways that a few years ago was just unthinkable. And that means that bad news travels really, really fast. If you're, you, you're a company and you don't make promises, people find out about it very quickly. Uh, scams are uncovered much more quickly. And particularly now if you're a company that is a scamming company, that's your business to be in scams. I guess you can change your name or, or, name or move on to the biggest scam. But uh, what about when one of our major corporations uh, tries to scam the American public? And I, I, the example we have in this year is the JCPenney and the phony sales. Uh, there's literally, a, there's an article uh, that you can read, uh, just, you know, listen to me and read uh, Brad Tuttle's Time article about uh, fake pricing. It's either fake pricing or phony sales at, at JCPenney. And he literally talks about, he got examples, hard examples, where they got proof that they went in and they, 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 they raised the price and then put it on sale. And, of course, at the time, what Pennies was doing was moving from an everyday low price to a high-low, where they try to make you feel that stuff is on sale. And they actually had, then a, you know, of course, an article in Time might have happened at any time. Of course, this is the digital version of Time. But the thing that's, that's, that's unique about the modern era is all of a sudden, the people who were doing this investigative reporting, they've got people who worked at Sears on YouTube video, talk, I mean, it's the whole world can see, talking about the fact that they took a set of $6 towels, raised the price to $12, and then uh, uh, went in and put a sign up saying that it's on 50% off. Uh, in some cases, they actually would, would, would go in and they would raise the price, like say from 6 to $12, but then they would put up a sign saying it's 40% off. So you're actually paying now $7.20 at the sale price for that $12 towel, whereas when it was everyday low price, so it's 40% off, but it's actually more than it was when it was uh, everyday low price is $6. And you got people that worked at Penny's, including one guy at the time that still worked there on YouTube talking to these reporters explaining what they did. Uh, and there's another article that came out recently. If you just Google phony sales at J.C. Penney's, there's a uh, what this has spawned is this has spawned people that literally go out and they check the prices. A group I want to say it's in Ohio, and they literally nailed them to the wall. I and mean, they went out and they checked prices and they they caught them, you know, having these phony sales. Now, in most the state laws are different. It's something that's governed by state law. Uh, it, it's not legal to do that in uh, probably about 50 of the 50 states to have a phony sale. But nobody really enforces it. I mean, when was the last time you heard about attorney generals in some state going after one of these guys? I guess if you, if you scam millions of people out of a little bit of money, then, you know, it's okay to just apologize and move on. But if you scam, like Madoff did, you scam a few people out of millions of dollars, you end up getting 155 years in jail. Uh, was particularly, you're scamming some of the richest and wealthiest, most powerful people in the country. You got a guy got 150 years in jail for that. Uh, will the executives of CEO get 150 years in jails if, if, if somebody eventually investigates this and they're, they're caught red-handed, which is kind of they've already been caught red-handed, just nobody uh, is investigated. Is that, is that going to happen? I, I don't know. It certainly wouldn't have happened uh, 10 years ago. Which wouldn't have happened. I mean, nobody would have noticed it. Somebody might have written an article about it. Then it would come up in the newspaper, and then it would be forgotten. Maybe that uh, author might win a, the local version of, of, of some kind of award. But th that would be it. I mean, it wouldn't, uh, no, nobody would notice it. But when, on the Internet, you know, you can still go back right now and read Brad Tuttle's article. It was written about a year ago uh, where they got caught dead. You can go back and see the people who are, uh, 
Uh, you can go back and see the people who are on YouTube that worked at Penny's claiming that this, you know, explaining exactly what they did. Uh, and then you can, so you can still see that. It's still there. And, and then there's a group of people talking about it underneath. So the, the consumers have so much more power. And the asymmetry of, in terms of the, the flow of information and the control of information that used to exist, where the corporations had all of the control, the seller had all the control, and the consumer had very little power, very little ability to get their story out there, and they were and, and very little peer-to-peer uh, -peer connection. All that's changed now. And of course, what that means honestly, honestly is that it's, it, it, it's more, more and more and more important to be honest and ethical. And maybe one of those uh, Dickens, Dickensian stories where the companies that are dishonest are going to fall by the wayside. Uh, J.C. Penney may be the next big, major, old-time, long-time retailer to go broke. Maybe. Followed by the Sears and Kmart, uh, Lampert's group, Sears and Kmart. Who knows? So maybe this is a story where the good guys uh, end up winning. But when the consumers have this power, it's much more important to be honest and ethical. It's much more important to... Uh, to, to not make promises that can't be kept and to, and to you know, to not have uh, issues with service and, and, and things like that. So the consumer has the power in the modern era. Now I'm going to talk about social media, which is literally a tidal wave. I mean, this social media phenomenon is a tidal wave. Uh, when I had focus groups among undergraduates in the marketing research class, I want to conduct a kind of pseudo focus group so they can see kind of how it's done and, and uh, by osmosis maybe pick up uh, some of this, how it's done and what it should be used for or maybe what it shouldn't be used for. I had a bunch of choices. I really wanted to do uh, uh, Facebook the Facebook social media site, talk about it more than anything else. But I had like four other choices and literally every 100% of my students use Facebook. Now the, the statistic I saw was 89% of people in the 16 to 25 area use Facebook. But among the undergraduates here at ETSU, it seems like it may be closer to 100%. The first one I'm going to first uh, aspect of social media I'm going to talk about is Facebook, and I guess if you said there's a tidal wave, Facebook was kind of the earthquake that made the tidal wave happen. You had other social media sites like MySpace, and uh, people when when I was in the years like 2000, 2001, 2002, people used to use a chat and connect with each other uh, via Yahoo and via other type of chat type of. Uh, uh, of operations and and the students in uh, in Korea and Japan in particular were avid users of chat. I, the boys played video games and girls used chat and would spend you know just go home and at home spend hours uh, chatting and talking to their friends. Of course, in Japanese and Korean, you can say a lot very quickly. They have very efficient languages in terms of typing. Much easier to type and and to to express yourself. Uh, adequately uh, in those languages than it is in a complex and and uh, poorly constructed language like uh, like English, but but nevertheless that was a really big phenomenon and that you know the ability to connect with people that way and they had place things like MySpace and and other types of precursors to this, but Facebook is really a revolutionary concept and the I, what's revolutionary about uh, Facebook from a business perspective is that they know who you are for a change. In the year 2000, or 1999, I remember uh, uh, going to Germany, 1999 or 2000, I remember going to Germany, and the people there were uh, booting their computers to, to Yahoo. And in the United States, many of the professors in my office would boot their computers to Yahoo. And, I, you know, we have a Korean professor at that time, and she booted her computer to Yahoo. And, you, you know, you go by, she'd turn on her computer, and it would be, you know, Yahoo boot was what was the portal. Uh, and and uh, my mother, my mother-in-law used to use, you know, had a Yahoo email account, and she would play like Yahoo Scrabble, and she did a lot of things on Yahoo. And Yahoo had the world's was number one in terms of the most most eyeballs. They had the most eyeballs. 
But they brought in somebody, you know, it's very typical. They brought in somebody that came from, like, casino background, and he's not a web person, and he, you know, the immediate thing that he saw was, okay, how do we monetize it? Okay, how do we get money? And they came up with premium content. You know, the premium, like, a super-duper email package. Nobody wanted it. Uh, games that you paid for, nah, nobody wanted it. They never really figured out how to monetize it. The, the stock of face of uh, Yahoo went from 200 uh, to nine. Now, if you look at the stock charts, it's going to show 100 to like four and a half. That's because it's split. The stock charts, if you look, then if you look at a Yahoo stock chart, say from 99, 2000, you can see it going up to about uh, split adjusted to be 100. In those days, it was before the two for one split, it was 200. It fell to about nine. Then it went back up to like 35. And now it, uh, you know, I split adjusted, I want to say it's, it's, uh, for the 2000 value, I mean, if you if you go back and unsplit it, I want to say it's selling for 35 now uh, or 36. It's in the high teens or something like low 20s right now. So they they lost the opportunity. What the Zuckerman did, and he was really ingenious, was that he he wanted to know who you were, and so you weren't just this anonymous eyeball. I mean, he knew your name, and then he knew where you lived, and he knew, you know, they have the tracking devices and the cookies, and they knew where you lived. Uh, you put information on there about hobbies and interests and, and things like that, so he knew what you did. If they had a cookie, you know, you had Facebook open, and you went over here, and you were playing one of the Blizzard games, you know, El Diablo or Captain America or one of the uh, one of those uh, massive shoot 'em up uh, online computer games. Well, he knew that. And if you were a news junkie, you know, you like to read uh, right wing blogs, you know, you spent a lot of time with uh, Michelle Malkin and, you know, Red State and uh, other types of right wing blogs. He knew that. If you were a, uh, you were a left wing news junkie, you know, and you, you were all uh, Talking Points Memo and Huffington Post and and places like that, he knew that, and he knew what, so he knew about you, knew, had a lot of information about you, and then that meant that they could target the advertising. So in terms of uh, the advertising effectiveness, they were the first, you know, these really big mega websites that has hundreds and hundreds of millions of eyeballs, the first one to really make that attempt to, to, to target and to because uh, it's a lot easier to go to a business customer and say okay look I can give you people who live in a certain zip code or I can give you people who we know are interested in right-wing politics and they go to right-wing websites and you you know you let's say you're a company that's uh, your job is to solicit money for uh, right-wing causes right-wing political candidates and stuff like that, you know, you, they could go to you and, and offer that targeted information or somebody's interested in, in fly fishing. And they spend a lot of time on fly fishing sites or they, you know, they're uh, connected and they, they, uh, they're click-through, they have click-throughs on fly fishing ads, but not on other, you know, fly fishing ads and fishing accessories and fishing tag. They knew that and they could tie that in. So that was that, that effective, uh, it, monetizing the eyeballs and even today we have other companies that are that are facing that challenge you know what is twitter going to do to monetize its its eyeballs where is what are they going to do i mean right now they they got the eyeballs but they don't know whose eyeball is sues very well and so the the challenge for them of, of monetizing and we talk about snapchat and some of the others um, go back come back to that issue of of monetizing the eyeballs Businesses really love Facebook. For one thing, they can create a, they can have their own Facebook page, and then they get something called likes, which they love. They love the whole idea of this. Somebody goes in and said they like this page, they like this company, they like this uh, entity on Facebook, and then when they do that, then that company's stuff gets put up on the wall or in the news feed, and they love that. Now, the, the problem with that is that the problem with the, some of that is that a lot of the companies that are using Facebook are using it in a way they don't have to pay Facebook anything. And in other words, instead of buying ads, they're getting, instead of, instead of advertising, they're PRing. And of course, PR is unpaid. 
Now they they may you may the, you don't pay for the the information that's put in front of the customer what you or potential customer what you're paying for you may pay somebody to manage it and there's a lot of money to be made in the next few years if I was you know a, you wanted to start a local business right now you were going to move to to uh, uh, you know some medium sized city somewhere. Chattanooga, something like that. Chattanooga, uh, Tallahassee, Jacksonville, uh, Pensacola, some you know medium-sized city. Uh, you notice I went kind of south from Chattanooga. Uh, I grew up in Florida, so you know, like going north. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> south. Uh, but the, if you're if you're doing that, I think the, the companies. The, the, you look at who are the most successful new entrepreneurs in those towns, or where are the opportunities are. That managing companies Facebook sites for them. Uh, organizing that and making, you know, that, that PR and maximizing the value of the PR. Also, uh, troubleshooting. And uh, whenever something happens, I know Tony Treadway gave an example where one of the companies that he managed a website had a customer that was felt, m felt perceived mistreatment on, a, uh, on account of uh, the fact that he was gay or she was gay. I don't remember if he said he or she. Uh, I'm, I'm relating a story secondhand. Well, they went in and they told the company, "Look, here's what happened. We have this customer. They're on Facebook. Well, they went to their. They knew, you know, right there. The next day, they're like at the customer's door or something. I don't know if exactly if I'm telling the story exactly right, but if I remember, somehow they knew where they were and they were right there on their Facebook page. And then they went to their door and they apologized, like the president's at the door of their customer apologizing for the perceived, you know, for the mistreatment and saying that that's not part of our, you know, our ethical policy is to treat everybody equally regardless of whatever creed or g gender or national origin or sexual orientation, whatever it is. Uh, we want to treat everybody equally, particularly if they're spending green money at our business. So they, they you know, that damage control public relations. Uh, so all of that is the, the business tie into this. When even on the Super Bowl, you'll see ads, you know, go to our Facebook page. You go to somebody's website and they'll want you to log in using Facebook. You know, they want to, a lot of companies use a Facebook login to get into their website. You know, that's one of the ways you could come in directly through Facebook. And so there's a lot of tie-in. They've done very, very successful at tying in business. And a lot of businesses are chasing likes. It sounds silly. There's a, even an ad about, out there about a little baby pushing the button that she likes a particular site. And, and a little baby keeps pushing the button that he, he, the baby likes that particular company's site, pushing the like button, and the company, the company goes crazy. All of a sudden, our product's a hit. We got all these likes. Start the presses, ships, planes, timber, all of that. We need all that, and it's actually just a little baby sitting there hitting like a thousand times on the company's website. Uh, successful PR stories when you hear people tell successful PR stories you know we did this we did that and and the likes exploded I mean it may seem a little bit silly and I guess I, to me it is a little bit questionable to me that huge multi national big corporations that you know have sales into the millions and billions of dollars get all excited about a few thousand likes on Facebook. I, I don't know, it seems weird to me, a little bit weird to me, uh, maybe a little bit like what was happening in the dot-com bust. But still, businesses are tied in heavily to Facebook, and they have really gone out and done a good job of co-opting and getting them to think of, I think when you think of a lot of businesses, when they think social media in terms of marketing, now they think social media marketing, they think Facebook. That's a, that's a, the only that's the first and only thing they think about. Uh, the there I have uh, you know there's a, a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, it's possible, and I, I have an article, and I need to get the citation for you. Maybe it's in the next slide. Uh, Wakefield, Wakefield's article: Facebook's days are numbered. Says that. Uh, Facebook will Facebook still be around three years from now? They're uh, falling off the 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 chart. They even admitted recently that they've lost a lot of business among uh, teenagers, and particularly young teenagers. 
in the you know your middle school, high school age teenager that they now migrated over to Snapchat or Snapchat or something like that. They're no longer you that they've a lot of their users are, are WhatsApp or something like that. And I think that the, uh, the the if you think okay, what's so great about Facebook is they know who you are. Okay, what's the big problem with Facebook? They know who you are. Uh, I, I have examples when I gave the uh, uh, f- the focus group last year. I had uh, the focus group that I did on social media last year on Facebook. One of the students there was a little bit older and had a job and work, and she said at our company, when you apply for a job, they, they go to your Facebook page. And they look at your Facebook page, and we've had you know people that you got to be really careful what goes on your Facebook page. And honestly, you know that I, when I was in Korea, a couple of the guys I played in a pool league, and uh, uh, one of the guys put uh, some pictures on my Facebook from something that happened, to, or you know, one of the nights at the pool game when there was you know. Uh, I don't know where some alcoholic beverages consumed and and uh, and you know sometimes you uh, you do things you wouldn't ordinarily do and, and I said doing what I'm doing what in the picture you put what kind of a picture of me at a bar drinking and playing pool and maybe I you know I don't know I might have uh, had a lapse of judgment and uh, had a, a thirty second conversation with. Uh, a member of the other sex and you know of course as a married man I normally I never even talk to women uh, I just you know very happily married guy and uh, so I had no idea what the pictures were and I and he said well and he made a big he made a joke I well you were doing you know doing this and you you know you're doing and I said please don't put any more pictures of Facebook and I literally took the pictures off and, and stopped using Facebook deleted my account stopped using it for several years it was, I, I said look my mother's on there my my sister's on there my you know my my daughters are on there uh, and for teenagers I think teenagers are at that age where they you know they first learn various different types of misbehaviors you know, and, and I'm, I don't mean major misbehaviors, many of the, you know, minor misbehaviors, like using a curse word or something like that. They learn, you know, when they become teenagers and they, they uh, knew phenomenon or maybe they did something a little bit naughty, a little, not majorly naughty, a little bit naughty, uh, a little bit naughty, and they don't want their parents to find out about it. And so uh, the, the, that's one of the issues with, with Facebook to me is that it's the fact that you do, they do know your name and you're, you're on there with your kind of your real name and everything means that you're you have to be care- very very careful what you say and what you put on there because other people including employers are going to be looking at that and uh, you know all of us have prone to some sort of misbehavior at some time for me you know I, I have a, a, like to play cards occasionally you know I have a misbehavior of that type, uh, not the womanizing type of misbehavior, never that uh, type of misbehavior, but other types of misbehaviors. I will have a diet Dr. Pepper with one of my uh, chums in the university after a ball game, an ETSU football game or an ETSU basketball game. In fact, after every ETSU football game and every ETSU basketball game, we usually go out and have a diet Dr. Pepper together, but I don't necessarily want that on Facebook. You know, that's not, I don't want that. I don't want that on Facebook. So for kids, they're losing a lot of their, their business with kids. So their big advantage is, their, is also their biggest problem. And uh, there are people that are that are on record. I mean, you know, people that put on say, I don't think this company is, is this company three years from now be a shell of what it is now. And will they even last? Will they, they made it, I think this is their 10th year or their 11th, 11th birthday or their 10th birthday. And will they make it to 20? And people are saying no in print, in major news publications uh, as uh, as Wakefield did uh, so the uh, the the other issue is that now they so that they may lose out and then it also the, the next big thing whatever that next big thing will be the snapchat or what's whatsapp or something that is a little bit different or something that's like Facebook but has maybe a little bit better privacy protections or has a little bit better uh, uh, anonymity, or, but it is still they, they still know who you are. Something along those lines, you know, maybe something like that. Who knows what the next big thing will be? Uh, and they may be they may end up like MySpace as the last big thing. Now, many of the companies. The other thing is that many of the companies are using for PR rather than advertising, which I mentioned earlier, which means they're not paying. 
You know, they're using it for, they, they love Facebook for PR, but they don't want to buy ads on Facebook. So they're using it for free, if you will, PR, if you want to think of PR as like free advertising. It's not really exactly what PR is, but we'll just for the sake of the moment. So the ability to of companies and entities to use it as a PR tool rather than an advertising tool is a challenge for them. Uh, finally, mobile advertising and the holy grail. Now, when Facebook IPO, uh, the stock fell. It, it, the IPO was uniquely unsuccessful. There were some technical issues involved. But also, generally, when you have a company that IPOs and then the stock falls, the stock fell, I think, up to about 50% of what the IPO price was fairly shortly after that. And the reason for, for this was that the, the business model that they were projecting was based on the revenue that they made through advertising and then through game playing. And I'm really skeptical of the game playing advertising. The f kind of freemium type of game playing where, you know, you get on a, you, you want to farm on Zunga or you want to do something and play one of the, the uh, play a game. Uh, some of the, the apps for the iPad, you know, you, if you, you play and then if you get killed five times, you have to wait 30 minutes. But if you pay 99 cents, you can start playing again right away or you get certain special things that make your farm, your Z Zynga game farm, Farmville or whatever it is, uh, Haydo, Haydo, Farmville, whatever the game is, it makes it better, you can buy stuff. You know, you can buy diamonds or you can buy stars or you can buy credits and then that allows you to do things that you can't do that the free players can't do. Freemium model. So that is a kind of freemium model games and I was really skeptical about the, the the I was really skeptical about that. Now uh, since that time at the uh, since that time the Facebook stock has recovered and recently it actually went above the IPO price uh, so that it's back up it's recovered all of its losses and it's now up in the black. And the reason for that is something that many people did not foresee at the time and that's mobile advertising. At the time that they IPO'd, they got 0% of their revenue from advertising. 0% of the revenue from advertising. Uh, a, a year later, uh, I, I listened to the analyst for the 23%. And then I happened to, be, uh, uh, to go and, and, and watch a podcast that was done by the guy who was the one who developed the, uh, the, their mobile ad content. And of course now Google totally dominates, totally dominates the, the field uh, of, of advertising on the internet, of advertising mobile, of everything involved really in the internet. They, they dominate search, they dominate advertising, they dominate you know everything. So Facebook has not touched them. Now last thing I saw was that 43% of their revenue, or was it 49 percent? 49 percent of their revenue came from uh, mobile advertising. Now if you think about what is the holy grail of advertising, what is it that we would really like to be able to do if we're in the business of providing information content, social media, whatever it is, we're providing a service to the people who, who come to our website and then we sell to advertisers access to those people who come to get our content for free. What is the holy grail of, of that field? And here, this is what it is. We would love to be able to go to a business and say, we know where our customer is. And we can advertise, we can set up an advertisement that will only be shown to people who are within three miles. City block metric. Three miles is square city block metrics. Within three miles of your business. Uh, we may have a business, a, a restaurant, say, a Darden restaurant, and they're at, at exit seven on 81. And we can say to them, we can advertise between the hours of 11 to noon 
and between the hours of, of say, 4.30 to 6.30 on, uh, p.m., 11 to noon or 4.30 to 6.30, for people who are driving on Interstate 81 and within 20 minutes of that exit, they're driving towards Exit 7 in Virginia. I'm talking about Exit 7 on 81, which is Exit 7 in Virginia. Not the Exit 8. There's an Exit 8, I think, on 81 in near Morristown. Uh, not that one, but the one in uh, Virginia. And and so people that are on the interstate, they're driving towards, they're either driving south from, in, from upper Virginia or they're driving north in northern Tennessee or they just crossed the Virginia border going north from Tennessee. And we can say to them, the customer is headed your way. It's the right time. I mean, we wouldn't want that ad in the middle of the night. It wouldn't do any good. So only during the premium time, only when people are right there headed towards your place of business. And that's all you're paying for. And you multiply that out mobile ad-wise. And, you know, people reach for their thing. They want to do their Facebook app. And, you know, they open up the app. And there's an ad for a restaurant at exit 7, right as they're fixing, you know, 50, at dinner time uh, when they're, you know, somewhere between three and 15 minutes away from exit seven, there's the ad for that for that restaurant. Think how much could be charged for that. What what would that be worth compared with say a newspaper ad? If you have a newspaper ad that it, it may be in a paper with a circulation of fifty thousand, which means what two hundred people? I'm joking. Uh, a couple thousand people will actually see the ad or pay any attention to it. Uh, it may be on a day when they're not going to exit seven. Many of the people don't live anywhere that may be, for example, getting a Tri-Cities newspaper may not ever go to exit seven. I haven't been up to exit seven in a long time. It's been several years since I've gone north. Well, no, that's not true. I was there last summer. Never. That's not right. I was last summer. Many of the people that of, of the 50,000 circulation, maybe only 2,000 see it, actually see it. You know, they may, another 5,000 may glance over it and never see it, but actually see the ad. How many of those people are interested? What, 200? And then of those 200, how many people are going to be going there in the next, I don't know, no, probably not very many. But now the newspaper wants you to pay for the 50,000 that, you know, circulation that they have. Whereas in this case, you have just that very specific targeted customer. So they're reaching for, they haven't quite gotten there yet. What has to happen, of course, they know where you are because you're, when you pick up your phone, you have to hit a cell tower. So you're on, you know, you're driving on 81. They know pretty much where you are. They can estimate pretty close where you are. And then they can tell what direction you're going by, you know, where the, the uh, half hour ago you checked Facebook and you were an hour south. You were 30 miles south of that. So they know kind of where you are and what you're doing. And then they would like to be able to translate all that information. And then they, then they can go to the customer and say, we have found the Holy Grail and we're we can sell it to you. You know, we're here to provide you with the Holy Grail of advertising. That space, people in the space at the time, and that's all you pay for. And uh, without the, the the mobile advertising, uh, Facebook might 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 be worth the, the stock may be a tenth of what it is today. But they're reaching for that, and they've obviously been very successful. They've gone from zero to you know almost half of their revenue in two years, two and a half years. Huge success. Uh, more and more people are going to be you doing something with something mobile. Right now, for a lot of people, that's their phone. But there's also the tablets. I think what you're going to see is uh, is the tablets being tethered to your cell phone, so that uh, you can. Uh, in, in the future, you'll have a you know people will have their cell phone on and they they tether that to their to to their to their tablets and their other types of devices, your iPads and other types of devices. And then they're using that to interact with the web or, or you know, even if you're just reading books or you're, you're playing games or you're doing stuff on the web, they're using that for access. And then that's, that's a huge, huge opportunity because you've got the GPS information, you know the time of day, you know where they are, 
uh, it's just a huge opportunity if it can ever be accomplished. So I'm very optimistic. If you were asking me, say, as an investor, I'm very optimistic about Facebook, not in terms of being the coolest site on the internet, which it, you say, okay, what's been the coolest site on the internet the last 10 years? Got to be Facebook. It, will it still be? Maybe not. Uh, will 90% or 95% of teenagers and young people use Facebook and use it regularly? I think the other thing I wanted to point out was the fact that that they, uh, uh, when people use Facebook, the usage frequency, there are many people that check Facebook every hour, every half hour. Uh, the length of time that they spend on Facebook uh, compared with other websites, other things they do on the web is is really huge. So, and it's not just that they have the eyeballs, the number, but also the frequency of usage, and then the length of time that people stay on Facebook is much more than than any other site. And so those, you know, that those things uh, may change. They may lose some of that, but the big opportunity for them, and I think the future for them, is going to be mobile marketing. All right, let's talk about. Uh, other social media. Uh, Twitter's a really big phenomenon, and, and the, the, the thing about Twitter that was really interesting was how, how quickly the, the, the beautiful people of society caught on to it. You know, all of your celebrities and all of the people, uh, media people caught on to it. Uh, journalists that like to cover things, for example, if you're uh, at the time that I'm taping this, it's a, a day before a National Signing Day. And the journalists for the big recruiting websites, uh, I'm talking about the American style football uh, recruiting sites, they all follow these like high school kids' Twitter account feeds. And so they tweet something, hey, I like my visit at, at UT. I uh, really like Knoxville. And then all of a sudden, it's like posted all over the place. So the, 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 uh, uh, somebody that was a, an actress from uh, Columbia who supposedly had like 4 million Twitter followers and, and a lot of big stars, you know, your Justin Bieber's. And, okay, Justin Bieber's not a big star. Okay, so, try to think of some other. He's a big star with like young kids that are like 12 to 16. Justin Bieber, a huge star with them. So you take a guy like that, and he's got millions of Twitter followers, and they can he can say, "Yeah, I'm sitting here at home, and I'm chilling, and I'm uh, I'm reading a book." Wow, Justin Bieber's reading a book, you know. And I, I so Twitter uh, became the kind of the darling, and it was it was promoted by the people who used it, and became a really big phenomenon. Now Twitter is supposed to be preparing, I think, to IPO if it hasn't been bought out, and I recently, and then I. Did, that I did not know about. But the, the problem for them, once again, is how to monetize. And this is a, another aspect of, you know, from a marketing standpoint, if you were working from them for them, how would you go about monetizing their, all their eyeballs and all the use that they have and everything? I mean, you can put ads on there, but you don't really know who everybody is. I mean, people uh, announce who they are and, and I guess you know some of the big celebrities and things like that. Maybe you know who they are, but you don't really know in the way that you know on Facebook because the Twitter handle doesn't have a name tied to it, and that means no targeting. It means no targeting. Uh, and so uh, if you can't target, then the, the value of each eyeball is way, way, way less than if... Uh, you can target. And then also there's the issue of, you know, they, they it's on there and then it gets deleted. So a lot of their data gets deleted. It's got a very short lifespan, which is kind of good and it's 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 kind of good in a way that it stays fresh, but it's kind of bad in the sense that you can't create some something and make it last for a long time. I, I keep uh, waiting for, you know, maybe some of these businesses that are really hot to have a Twitter feed. And uh, maybe they can have a spokesperson that has a Twitter feed or there's going to be some better connections to what businesses are doing, the way that Facebook has co-opted businesses. But Twitter's challenge and, and, and the challenge for using Twitter as a social media marketing vehicle if you go work for another company. So the challenge for them is, you know, how do they eyeball? If you're using Twitter for marketing, how do you target you know, that's the challenge. Okay, if you're going to go to a, a client of yours and you're going to say, look, what we do is we like to use Twitter for advertising. 
like to advertise. Well, how do you do that? Uh, I, you know, what? Who, who do you target? I mean, who, where would the ad be shown? And things like that. Maybe they can do some things. So for them, it's a matter of figuring out their targeting. And until it gets figured out as much as it's used, and it's actually a very convenient tool. And if you're a journalist and you need to follow certain people, you know, you're a journalist that uh, follows the, the, the Tennessee Volunteer uh, American-style football team. Uh, you can keep all the, the, the players on Twitter, and you can follow the, the tweets that the, the, the assistant coaches do. Uh, they're not supposed to tweet about prospects, but they tweet where they are and what they're doing and uh, what's going on. And the, you can follow the potential recruits and uh, that kind of thing uh, on Twitter. And so it's a very convenient type of tool. How useful it is for marketing I, right now, I, I don't see it. I, I, not the kind of thing that's gonna uh, that you're gonna have a lot of success using. Uh, Snapchat is another one. I think Snapchat is the one is the entity that's kind of taken the market share among the young teenage group away from uh, Facebook. And so Snapchat might be the next thing. It's kind of a video. It's a quick chat, but also a video sharing service. So you you know you share services with it, video services with it. Where is Snapchat going to generate revenue? Uh, it could be that you see you might the one. There are several different options. Uh, it could be that you're going to see uh, kind of quick couponing, like coupons. Because the thing about Snapchat is that it, it that's good for them is that the data is deleted almost as soon as it comes in. So it only stays live for a very short amount of time. And which means though, if you think about it, that if, if what Snapchat has is its data and it's is and then it's deleted, you know, after a few seconds or after a few minutes, uh, they're deleting all their, their data. Uh, and so all the the value of the company gets deleted every ten seconds. Well, that you know makes it easier on the servers. Uh, it makes it easier on the servers, but it's I'm not sure that. Uh, uh, and you can it can be quick and fast, and people can enjoy using it. But with and then not have to worry about you know it uh, saying something when they're chatting that is going to get them in any trouble later on. Uh, the thing is though that that they don't really have any way to target. Uh, and so if you've got, and re, uh, you don't have any way to target, if you've got no data, no targeting, you've also got no revenue. Uh, maybe they'll go into coupons, these short-lived coupons that are only available for a short period of time. Uh, there are several other options. Uh, the, they're, they're selling emojis. Which I don't know. One of the a website like Snapchat in uh, Japan had a lot of success. Is I'm emojis is a emo, e m o, which is for emotion, and then the G's is the the little uh, emoticons, the your your smiley face, and the other types of things. They they I don't know. They sell those for use in uh, uh, that that people can use. Uh, maybe uh, uh, coupons that are re that are really have a short lifespan, and the nice thing about coupons for a business starting out that's trying to build a revenue model, which they really don't have a revenue model yet, uh, it, that's trying to build that revenue model is when you use coupons, the businesses can see that it's working because they have people bringing in the coupons to buy stuff. I mean that's proof that it's working, or the the uh, there may be a code that's available just for a few seconds. And then you gotta, you know, you gotta write down that code, or you gotta somehow save that code, and then you go into business, and it may be good for a day, maybe good for two days, and it, it, it companies uh, really like to ha to have things happen quickly. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of focus in American business. We talked about this earlier. The next quarterly report, you know, getting earnings up and f fitting the next quarterly report. So I think. Uh, in terms of, of getting eyeballs and adding users, and obviously Snapchat's been successful. Whether it's going to be a very practical marketing platform now is a different story. I, I'm not really optimistic about it. Um, you know, I, there's an article, uh, Edwards has an article, Edwards is the author, Snapchat is intrinsically worthless. If they've got no snap data, they delete their snap their snap data, then they don't have any targeting, no ad revenue. Uh, 
Luckerson's got an article about how they might build a revenue model. Supposedly, I guess uh, Facebook at one time was scared of Snapchat. Just, I mean, and it, which turned out to be uh, prophetic. And they tried to buy them for like three billion dollars, and the Snapchat people said no. Apparently, uh, it, uh, it doesn't make sense on either end, really. Uh, but if they don't have, and I guess they think that they're going to be able to monetize it somehow. And they're just looking for how to do that. So uh, whoever figures that out is going to be successful. But for right now, I, I don't know. LinkedIn is a very is a, a much more successful model, in my opinion. I, I, it's not to say I don't want to think you rush out and buy LinkedIn stock. Because their ability to expand is is much more limited. Your, your uh, Snapchats and your WhatsApps may be... The, the, the chance of them being 20 times bigger two years from now than they are today is, is of course, it'd be hard to be 20 million, 20 times bigger when they have, a company has 400 million users, you know, to go, but the chance of them being way, way bigger and more successful in a few years than they are now is very high. But LinkedIn has a, a very solid business model. They have a much more solid business model in that they're, they're focused on people's business life and what you're doing in your business life. And many companies now are hiring off of LinkedIn. When we have, we've had students come, we like to have students come back who, you know, successful. And we've had students that come back executives in different businesses and talk. And many of them, uh, it's amazing how often one of them has said that I got this, this job from here to here from LinkedIn. And then how did I, how did I, why did I go from here to here? Well, somebody contacted me on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is a, and, and I think, I know the, uh, we professors here in, uh, we require the students to get involved in LinkedIn, in LinkedIn, and we highly recommend that you build a LinkedIn profile and put your portfolio on it. I recommend that y'all MBA students do that. So it's a very excellent social media site focused on, Recruiting. I mean, if you need to hire people and you need to find uh, people to, uh, you have a particular need in your business or you want to get hired, uh, it's a very good site. Uh, it's a, if you're advertising for certain types of things, uh, for example, you have a business that's involved in career building. You have training or you have workshops or you have some other aspect of the process of building human capital. You know, you go to you go to college to, to become to learn things and become smarter and to build human capital and then you get your degree, that's supposed to signify that you learned a bunch of things and that you're now able to be hired and be successful in the business world and and so if you have businesses like that, uh LinkedIn's gonna be very important. I think when we start our new program, uh the masters in, in uh, digital marketing program. Uh, when we start that program, LinkedIn is going to be probably one of the places where we advertise. So the LinkedIn is a very good social media platform for that type of thing, for work-related, business-to-business, uh, and human capital building types of uh, operations. That's a very, very good uh, opportunity. WhatsApp is the final one I'm going to talk about. And uh, WhatsApp is, is it's, it's, a, it's another one of these things that seem to indicate seem to indicate that there's the, in the battle between the web versus the, the, the app. You know, there's the web and then there's apps, that the apps seem to be winning. Uh, and it's another free app that allows uh, social media type of interactions. But once again, uh, you know, it's, is it worth anything? or not. Their model, they don't have any revenue yet. Their model is the freemium model. Meaning and what they're planning to do is give you one year of free content on WhatsApp. And and so it's a social media site. They don't really they don't know who you are. In the, in the sense of what Facebook knows. They know a couple things about you, but they don't know much. And so whether they're going to be able to monetize that, but it's been really successful. They've got 400 million or something like that, the number of uh, new users that they have every quarter. And it's become, after I think Snapchat and Facebook, the third biggest in terms of number of eyeballs, at least in the English part of the world. And I'm talking about in the English speaking part of the world, uh, kind of the third biggest. And they, uh, they're they planning on after the first year, once you see the value of it, charging you 99 cents a year, which isn't much, but you know, you have it is a revenue stream, I and mean, you got hundreds of millions of people paying 99 cents. Now, the thing is that 
a lot of the people who are users of this, how are they going to pay the 99 cents? Maybe they get some PayPal money or something from their, from their mom or their dad. I and mean, these are, you know, young people that, a lot of young people, 11, 12, 13, 14, where are they going to get a credit card from? So, then, you know, getting people to pay even a very small amount in a web environment where so much is free, very questionable. And I was, just like I questioned the freemium game concept, you know, the where you, you get killed five times in uh, Power Birds or, or Candy Cane or one of, those, uh, uh, one of those games, you get killed five times and you have to wait 30 minutes or pay 99 cents to keep playing. And they want to get you, you know, they want to show you the value of what you do and then they think you're going to willing to pay 99 cents. Uh, so far, there are a few companies, a Blizzard in online gaming, for whom the, the subscriber model has worked. Uh, many other entities have tried to develop a subscriber model. And going back to my discussion about Yahoo at the beginning of the dot-com buzzle, what we really wanted was they wanted to get some content that you would be willing to subscribe to, to pay for. And it's not been very successful. Uh, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that people are fearful uh, they get scammed a lot. They, uh, you, you know, you got to enter your, you got to give them your credit card. Or you, you know, you got to pay something for some, uh, buy it with PayPal. There's a lot of people that are hesitate to do that. A lot of people, kids, uh, teenagers, don't have access to credit cards. So, so the freemium model, we'll see how it works. My guess is that they'll, that that won't work, and they'll try something else. Uh, we've seen it. The same thing is is happening now with uh, paywalls for news content. The different newspapers and stuff will try to put up a paywall. They'll put up a hard paywall, a soft paywall, uh, with many of the soft paywalls being so soft that it's almost like not even they're not even there. So the, the paywall issue in newspapers and uh, the, the, the digital premium, the, uh, the subscriber model has not worked very well. We'll see what happens with WhatsApp. Uh, now, we're going to talk about B2C in module 10 and the only thing that I want to add is what I call hybrid model the hybrid I think I call it in module 10 the hybrid model uh, we think of it as hybridization and that's where you have companies that have an offline presence in other words their main the main way that they sell or market their goods may be offline but they're using online uh, systems to improve the delivery of that content for order taking and things like that it can be as simple as restaurants like Domino's, which has been advertising. Instead of calling us and trying to explain, you know, you want anchovies on this part of the pizza, but you don't want anchovies on this part, or you put garlic on a couple of, you know, all that all the different options online you know if you got 20 different pizzas and uh, three different sizes and 20 different things that can go on it and you can half and half it and all that you end up with like 200 choices and how can you explain that over it's very difficult to explain over the phone whereas online it's very easy you know what do you want what do you what do you like on your pizza okay here's we got these options here are our specials here are the deals whatever it is and it's much easier you can get the order in online you get a conference information email you pick it up in 30 minutes or they deliver it in 30 minutes if it's a, a delivery place uh, it's much easier to do for them to do it online also the guarantee money's guaranteed because usually they'll have you pay in advance uh, this was the main way that there's a Domino's and Papa John's have a huge footprint in Korea I mean there's a Domino's pretty much in every neighborhood and uh, Papa John is about just about as popular, just about as successful in Korea. And people normally order, they very rarely do people call in anymore. They almost all order via the internet and they go ahead and pay and then it gets delivered to them and they, or they pick it up if it's you know, the, the pickup uh, place. And uh, that, so that's the way that people normally order. Now getting Americans to stop picking up the phone and to use the internet is going to be a little bit of a challenge. I think they'll still be taking orders over the phone for the next forever probably, but, but they want to do more and more of their business over the internet. It's so much more efficient for them than it is to have somebody there's that constant ringing of the phone and and it must drive the workers crazy you know the phone's ringing and, and, and it's the way things happen in the if you work in the vast service what Dennis Miller calls the vast service Google 
what happens is that you may not have any phone calls for 20 minutes, and then all of a sudden you get 10 phone calls within the space of, 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 of a minute and a half. It just doesn't seem to ever space itself out or work itself out. You get a whole on the web, they can handle that. All of a sudden, you got 10 orders come in on the web all in a minute and a half, no problem. I mean, you still have to go through and fix all of them and get them all ready to go and everything, but it's not like you have to sit there on the phone. I mean, wait a minute, I'm going to put you on hold. And then you got somebody asking you 15 questions and you, you know, you got a, you know, you got 10 other calls coming in. And so, uh, so you're going to see more of that. Uh, many, one of the problems that a lot of companies have is that there's a possibility of them becoming a showroom. And so something like a Best Buy. You go in, people go into Best Buy, they look around, they look at the options, and they go to Amazon and order it. You know, they talk to the salesman, they say, okay, there's this one, that one, this one does this, this one does that. And then they go to Amazon and order it. I, I think you're going to see... Uh, the, one of the one of the things that's gonna that, that you're gonna see in the future is you're gonna see smaller, uh, smaller per square foot stores, with a lot more products, a lot more products. But you may have to pick that product up in a few days. You know, order it and pick it up in a few days. Uh, and and so what it, the, what happens is that that the the company gets the break on shipping and and if you think about how shipping works, uh, it's much easier and very cheap to get a whole container unit full of something than it is t at one place that that regularly runs from place X to place Y. Uh, it's much cheaper to do that per pound than it is to send something one thing to one person's house and you got to have UPS or somebody like that deliver it. So the problem with B2C over the internet is the for a lot the big problem is the shipping and in terms of being cost effective. Uh, but it's if people can go to, to a showroom type store, understand that that many of the things are not going to be in stock. And that, you, you know, you, you buy it, you go ahead and look at, here's a sample, here's how it works. You buy it, it'll be in in three days. And you don't have to pay shipping for it. Because for the, comp for the, for the retailer, the shipping is exactly the same as if they had shipped the product to the store uh, in, in the bricks and, uh, a, a traditional bricks and mortar store, and then it sat in the back of the store in inventory. But in this case, they have a, 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 a kind of mandatory or, or automatic just-in-time inventory solution because the product only comes in when there's a buyer. And so the person then goes back in two or three days and picks it up at the store. And so there's no, not the cost, that extra cost of shipping a single thing to somebody's house, which is much more than shipping a whole container unit full of stuff from a, a warehouse X to a warehouse Y, uh, or to place X to place Y in regular format. Uh, you're going to see more of, of uh, I think you're going to see, you might see possibly in the grocery business a pre-ordering type of system where you can uh, contact the grocery store, put in an order, and it'll have your name on it, and you go in and you check through and say, okay, they were out of Heinz ketchup, so they put Hunt's in. And you say, no, no, I, I can't do that. Or they, they didn't have diet Dr. Pepper, so they put regular Dr. Pepper in. And you say, well, no, I can't drink regular Dr. Pepper. I've got to have, I'd rather have, if you don't have diet Dr. Pepper, give me diet Coke or diet Pepsi instead of. But So you can check your order, and you can make sure you can look at the produce and stuff like that. But basically, it's all done. It's there for you. You go in, you grab it, uh, you pick it up, and you leave. So you don't have to wander around the store and, and pick stuff up. So you may see some of that like pre-ordering over the internet or uh, uh, ways of saving the customer money by having them pre-order in the internet in, in grocery stores and some other types of traditional retailers for clothes and things like that. You may see a little bit less of this. The, the one thing I think you would be able to see is that, that it's a real problem for stores in trying to keep sizes. You know, you've got, say, this shirt. Well, how many sizes do we keep it in? Do we need to keep it in from everything from like 14 and a half up to 19? I mean, you know, American people are getting larger. They're getting more overweight, more obese. Do we need to go all the way up to 19? I mean, it's a, then that's a cost. Then you, so you, you put this shirt in, and it sits there, and all the 16 and a half and 17, the 17 and a half sell out, 
but none of the 18s and 19s sell out. Or more likely here in East Tennessee, all the 18s and 18 and a halfs, 19s sell out, but you, you, nobody's buying the 15s and 15 and a halfs. So that's a real problem in terms of the, you know, so you, what you may see is that stores will keep fewer sizes on hand. And then people will order uh, the you know, we'll, we'll be more likely to order. And you'll see that for, uh, in terms of clothes, for shoes and for shirts and pants and things like that, where people have a pretty good idea what size they want. And so you may see that retailers have to carry less. And in areas where you have a really high cost, cost per square foot, you may see more smaller stores that kind of act like showrooms, where, you know, they don't have a lot of stock. They've got examples of the different the different products, but they don't have a lot of stock, and they may go in and they may have some sort of sizing model where they can, you know, uh, maybe put a tape measure around your neck or look at your inseam and say, okay, it looks like to us, Dr. Shimwell, you need like a 46 jacket. You know, we measured you, you, you look like a 46 and a, a arm length 34, and, and uh, you know, that's what, uh, the, and then we'll we you know here's the different colors and the different fabrics and and uh, we'll it would be here in four days and you don't have to pay shipping. All right, sounds good. I'll you know so there there may be more. So that's the B to C kind of hybrid model. I think you're going to see more and more of this type of thing where it's common for you to go into a store and not expect them to have your size of shoe or not expect them to have your size of shirt and you order it and you come back in three days and pick it up. Uh, or, and even though you may go in, feel the fabric, touch it, because the, the problem with a pure internet model is you can't really feel the fabric, you can't really touch it, you can't really try on, you know, you can't really try it on. Uh, so that there's a... Uh, so the pure internet model, I don't know if it's ever going to come to dominate in clothing and apparel and stuff like that. I'm not optimistic. I think more of a kind of where the, the retail store maybe becomes like a showroom, but a showroom for their own products. And then you order over the internet. Now, business to business, and y'all may not be aware of this, but as much as B2C has been slow to develop, you know, where you thought, Bill Gates thought in 1995 that 50% of sales would be on the internet in 10 years, and that hasn't happened. Not going to happen anytime soon either. But in B2B, it's been totally taken over by electronic platforms and streamlined uh, vendor processes. Where a, and, and the typical way this will happen is that there will be either a, a third-party platform and there was a company here that did that in healthcare products. It might be a third-party platform that uh, puts buyers and sellers together for, say, uh, healthcare products, you know, hospital products, your rubber gloves and your surgical devices and all of those types of things, and puts that are that are reordered and ordered. And a, and a, a hospital will put up a request for proposal. We need, you know, a million rubber gloves. Uh, and we'd like them delivered, you know, uh, we'd like to order a million rubber gloves over the next year, 50,000 a, uh, a month. Uh, and they got to be to certain specs. And then people will, will the, the, the vendors will pre-qualify, meaning that they'll have to meet certain standards. And uh, if something happens and they deliver a shoddy product and they, they're liable to get kicked out of the system, and so you have pre-qualified vendors, and those vendors come in and bid. Whoever wins the bid gets to sell the product to that particular uh, entity. And the B2B has been really taken over by the digital revolution. And many of your larger companies have their own platforms. They've got their own B2B platforms, in a, like, say, a, an automobile company will have its own platform, and they say, okay, I need a you know, a million rubber bushings. This is not a rubber bushing, but say a rubber bushing like that. I need not a million, I need two million of them. 
two million rubber bushings, and it's and they write the specs. It's got to be up to a certain standard. It's got to be screw in. They've got pictures of what they want. They explain what it goes in, and then companies that are qualified to bid go in and bid, and whoever wins the bid gets to sell those two million rubber bushings to that company. So that uh, the marketing process is actually looking for requests for products. Or in a more complicated, if it's software or something like that, some sort of software or service type of product, uh, or a processes, a, you know, companies that are marketing service processes as opposed to physical products, uh, that companies will post the request for proposal electronically. Uh, you develop an electronic proposal. Now they may allow you to go in and make a physical presentation to the buying center. At some point, if you're one of the finalists in terms of the proposal, and uh, you get to ask questions, but you may even may not, not even do that. It may all be done by uh, uh, electronic conferencing. You got three companies come in, and they all make their pitch, and uh, for a, a, say a marketing research project, and all three companies come in and make their pitch, and they say what they're going to do, and they. Uh, give some examples of what they've done that's similar to that in the past, and they sat, you know, cite some of their satisfied customers. And once the idea is pitched, the company says, "Okay, we'll take companies. We'll take. We don't like company A's. Company B and C are pretty close. Company B's cheaper. We'll go with company B." And that's uh, that's how it's done. So B two B has been really taken over, and the marketing has become marketing and business to business has become so digitized, and it's all you know, uh, which to the, the 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 old kind of traveling salesperson, you know, that would go in and he'd take a fishing rod to this guy and say, you know, hey, you know, be buddies of uh, the, the old buddy buddy network, the old boy buddy buddy network of uh, salespeople that worked. Uh, in in these different B two B fields, uh, a lot of that has gone by the wayside. You know, it used to be years ago, for example, that a Procter and Gamble would have sales reps. They would go in the store, and they would fluff the Procter and Gamble products. And every you know every district uh, had reps, and they would go in, and they knew the managers of every store, and that you know a lot of what they would do, they would fight for a shelf space. And they had the old Procter and Gamble motto: uh, motto is uh, 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 stack it high, price it low, and watch it go. And that was their motto. And now they, you know, that's all disappeared. I mean, there's no need for reps now. Procter and Gamble has its headquarters uh, right in the same building as Walmart or right down the hall from Walmart, or right across the street from Walmart in Bentonville, and they uh, they deal with each other at that level. They don't have salespeople calling on every Walmart store. Uh, that you know they don't need that. So everything is turned to B to B. A lot of this has been to make things more efficient. You know the old method of the the purchasing agent being the uh, person most able to run a fast one on his employer. Uh, and you know a, I remember a, a really sleazy friend of mine in uh, Tallahassee had some was backing somebody for governor, and he says, "All I want to be is a purchasing agent." You know, make me the purchasing agent, and that's all I want to be. And, of course, the guy was a crook, and he was not, you know, purchasing agents a, the, a, a job that crooks love. And all that's kind of gone by the wayside now. Uh, it's, it, every, you know, may, all your major companies, major entities, are, 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 have their own B2B purchasing platform. And the vendors have to learn to work within that system. Or uh, in, in for smaller if you have in an industry where you have a lot of smaller buyers, like say in healthcare, uh, those companies are using you know these third-party run uh, websites that put buyers and sellers together. You know they they post proposals, they take bids, they pre-qualify people so that they the 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 hospital or healthcare entity knows that whoever's bidding is is qualified to bid on that. Okay, now the final thing, we, we mentioned it earlier with the fact that Facebook is going, is mobile. And the, the, the holy grail of advertising is to know where people are and then be able to put an ad up that's relevant to where they are. Of course, what time of day it is and who they are. And kind of we know what time of day it is and who they are. We, we got out already, but put that together with knowing where they are.
And that's the goal for mobile ads. Now, right now, ads don't work very well on smartphones. And they, they kind of get in the way and they irritate us. And uh, we don't like them very much. And there's so little space on there. If you're trying to do something on the web and they put an ad in there, then there's not really any space left for me to figure out you know, what's going on. Uh, most of what people are using, the web is very clumsy in mobile in particular, and people prefer, mobile is an area where people definitely prefer apps. And so you have apps that people use, and then oh, many of them are free apps or extremely, extremely cheap, and then in order to, you know, while using the app, you're able to expose them to, to advertising and things like that. The key is, is to tie the data in. If you have an app that, that, but you don't know who's using the app, you don't know, you know, you don't have access to any of the information, you don't have any cookies that are, or, or other types of tracking devices that are able to figure out what that person is doing or where they are, you know, you don't have like the GPS tracking. I mean, there's some, the issue of is it okay to GPS track? Is it not okay to GPS track? There's uh, arguments to be made on both sides of that from a privacy perspective. And then if you are tracking on GPS, who gets to use that? Does somebody that has a, a game app, do they get access to that? Do they get to know where, where you are so that they can, you know, break into that uh, advertising mode? Do they partner with somebody like maybe like Google or use Google AdWorks or something like that, partner with them? That's what most people are doing now is that they're partnering with Google and Google knows this stuff. Uh, so the, the putting together for mobile, uh, mobile marketing is going to be big. More and more people are going to have smartphones. The, uh, some of the things that are, of all, uh, you know, even two years ago, a year and a half ago, I remember talking to my brother who is a patent lawyer and who does software patents. And we we're talking about this issue with the metered content. You know, so many people get a smartphone, but then they meter the content so that if you use too many web pages, you get hit with a big bill. You know, you have a real strong, tight limit on what you can do, and nobody wants that anymore. And the companies now realize that that's kind of been blown away. That that kind of model where they charge you every time you you go to, but you get a certain number of free web page looks, and then after that, or you use a certain number of apps, so you use the, the you know certain number uh, of different you you overuse your data and you get a huge charge for it, a lot of that is going to go by the wayside. So you're looking at situations where people are going to have 4G phones, and there's going to be a lot more access to content. They're going to be doing a lot more stuff on their phone than they used to. I may get to the point where you'll see people, instead of riding around with, uh, uh, with iPads and stuff, uh, tablets and iPads and things like that, uh, that they'll be, you know, sitting there on the subway or on the bus or on the, the, the train, and they're sitting there, you know, using their smartphone to play games and do everything else because it's just more convenient to carry that thing around. It's, it's much more convenient. And also, the, 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 uh, your iPad right now, at least here, and for those of y'all that are international, this is not really as much of an issue, but it's an issue of access to the Internet. You know, access to, if you don't have access to the Internet, you don't have access to the games. You don't, I mean, you're kind of stuck. You can sit there and read, uh, you know, you can read a book that you've downloaded, but you can't do really that much else with that pad. So the mobile, the fact that the mobile has mobile access, through the cell tower uh, means that a lot of people are doing stuff. You see people sitting around playing games at the airport and stuff like that on their phones and and things like that. So it's uh, uh, the the mobile advertising is going to be big. But now the key thing is once again the holy grail. The question, the test question, in particularly this semester, has to do with that holy grail issue. To explain that the holy grail of of, of uh, digital marketing, uh, the holy grail of digital market of advertising in the digital field in the digital age. And uh, so that's going to be the key question. I think mobile is going to get bigger and bigger, but we have to scale. You know, we have to figure out how to scale. We have to figure out how to target without violating people's privacy. There's, you know, we just have to figure out a lot of things in terms of how to do this. And even though it's, uh, even though it's where the future is and it's big right now, I'm not sure where it's going. And I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Uh, it's, with regard to mobile. I mean, are there going to be companies that have ad blocker apps? There are probably already com companies out there that have that. Is that going to, you know, what's going to happen with that? So where we're going with that, 
uh, we'll, I'll have to give a different lecture on this uh, on mobile advertising next year. But I do want you to know it's uh, it's going to be big in the future. Okay, that's it for this module, which is module six, and it's the digital marketing module for marketing strategy, uh, which will probably only be good for 2014, maybe 2015. Uh, thank you very much.